Thank you so much for doing this, Vijendra. Thank you. Thank you for being uh, so accommodating to all my tech difficulties earlier. No, no, no. I mean, uh, it would have been it would have been my loss if I did not get a conversation with you. I have been researching your work extensively since I got a hold of some of it, and um, it has been. It's been it, to say it was impressive would be an understatement. So thank you so much for being the voice of sanity and reason in a very chaotic discourse that we find ourselves in back in India for me at least. Do you agree? Thank you. I I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this because your bio reads art student. I'm wondering how old yes. you are. I'm uh, close to forty. Oh yes, I would not have guessed. I would have guessed somewhere closer to twenty eight, twenty nine. Well, yeah, you've got part of it right. It's thirty-eight ish. Oh, so. right, right, right. Interesting. And what is it that you do uh, ap- apart from the the social media noise that you make? What else do you do? I uh, I'm a comic book writer, mm-hmm. so I write comic books, and uh, that's pretty much it for the last uh, four or five years. Before that, I was running a YouTube channel called mm-hmm. Epified, mm-hmm. which was about Hindu mythology and Indian history. Mm-hmm. And before that, I was uh, kind of sort of a journalist. Hmm. Yeah. So is that yeah. is that how you know Bucker Max? Bucker Max from the comic sphere. Yes. Right. 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 We, okay. we meet at comic cons. He's selling his books. We are selling our books. Right. Right. It, how do you such, know him? Um, he came into my circles because of the the recent work he's been doing, which is safe to say is far beyond my imaginable territory of what is okay. He is. Pushing I the think, envelope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's one of the smartest comic book artists, creators, who are working out of India right now. I, I mean, I don't understand the sphere deeply enough to make that comment, but I would definitely, if somebody's ever watching this, I would definitely suggest them to go check out Bucker Max on Instagram Max. and YouTube. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And you know, the funny part is, uh, I was supposed to do a podcast with him when I was in India in January. I never got around to doing that, but I think I have given him enough subscribers and listeners and watchers by now because almost everybody I interact to, I, I somehow end up just referring to that man's genius. I think he's doing yeah. such a phenomenal job at pushing the envelope with a comical head to it. Yeah. Right. He's uh, also done some uh, comic book uh, training workshops in Mumbai for young people or even older people who want to make comics. He right. and a few others like, uh, have you heard of Abhijit Kini? No. Abhijit Kini does a comic book called Angry Maushi. Hmm. So he and Bakar Max and a few others do comic book workshops. Insane. Those are also very useful for whoever might want to do it next. So it's not much of an industry. So mm-hmm. we keep the doors open. Right, right. No, and I understand. And it's surprising that it's not much of an industry given how much of the literature I was consuming. And just for reference's sake, I'm 24. So I mean, midnight, like late 90s and early 2000s. You said, oh my God. (laughs) Right. I was, I was consuming so much of Champak and Tinkle and all of that stuff and Chanda Mama and and all Nandan, all those, uh, all those comics. It's, it's surprising how that industry abruptly died down except for a few like valiant survivors who were continuing to uh, yeah, yeah, up, yeah. right uh, there was a there was a huge uh, kind of a i guess it's some kind of an economic issue but some survived uh, making a loss for nearly a decade hmm. Hmm. i mean does that have something to do with moving the medium from paper to bits and bytes I don't, I don't know, honestly, uh, I, I don't want to say something about why this happened without knowing the re- exact reasons, but I think the internet overall has been a positive, uh, you know, factor as far as comic book industry, no matter what the country, uh, they survive on community mm. and the internet created that community in India. People in their twenties coming online for the first time found out that there was a Facebook group for comic book lovers and that's how it became a thing again. Hmm. Hmm, 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 hmm. Interesting. How does, how does somebody who does comics, especially on mythology ends up being yeah. an angry art student, a rational atheist using words as weapons? How does, how does that transformation happen? So the angry art student thing actually goes back to a Twitter thread. I wrote a few years ago, which was about uh, how there is this, uh, invisible, uh, class system of, uh, educational disciplines 
where science is at the top and arts are at the bottom. Mm. So I was kind of tracing our present day political turmoil back to the whole humanities versus science stream problem. Mm. And it was quite long and quite angry and it, it went viral a little bit. And I was amazed that it was such a South Asian problem, like mm. not just from India, but from neighboring countries. Also people wrote in to say, this is exactly what I have been thinking about my whole life. And I think it, it's a uniquely South Asian problem. And I have been angry about it my whole life. So that's why my bio says angry art student. Uh, So what kind of arts did you study? And what was the essence of of that tweet thread? I'm interested on both accounts. I am a writer. And uh, since I am a comic book writer, I am surrounded by artists. And because I was running a YouTube channel, I was also... uh, to a certain extent surrounded by actors who are trying to make it big and musicians and video editors. And these were all children who, these are all kids who grew up with a love for arts. And these are all kids who are told to become engineers or doctors because that's what Indians become. And these are all kids who fought it and came out choosing arts in any case. So that struggle to remain an artist is actually quite huge. Hmm. It's Hmm. a pressure that kills a lot of artists in India, not physically, but you know, spiritually, right? You cannot go for arts because it's not going to make you money. And uh, as a result of that, a whole lot of people who go for science also don't want to go into sciences. And as a result, we get engineers and doctors who send us, who send us uh, WhatsApp forwards with, you know, mostly superstition in it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I it, so, so scientific outlook is something that is missing, mm-hmm. and arts is in any case looked down upon. So we are fucked both ways. <laughs> so no, tell me. Um, I'm I'm more interested in discovering the cause of it because I've been having some debates about education with a few friends of mine here and there. You know, there is a recent resurgence of the idea, and I say resurgence because this idea was in. Act, was active um, a few generations ago, this resurgence of don't send your kids to MBA schools, don't get them, the college education is no longer worth it and so on. And so I have been having a discussion on that account somewhere else. And it's tangentially related to what what you seem to have done on that post. And I'm wondering if this problem is that of societal conditioning or is this a free market problem? Well, it's societal conditioning, yes. But now that you mention it, it's also a market problem because people don't choose science, as I said, because of scientific curiosity. They choose science because it gets them more well-paying jobs. Right. And we don't have an ecosystem where an artist, uh, a, a young person interested in the arts can be nurtured and go ahead in life to become uh, someone who has a good life. Right. I mean, struggling artist is almost a cliche. Hmm. Nobody says struggling engineer or struggling doctor. Hmm. There are, there are, there are, there are structures that are waiting to accommodate you once you go into the sciences. Hmm. But the artist, for the most part, has to make do with his or her own initiative. Right. So uh, it is a market thing. Hmm. But in recent times, ever since the advent of the internet happened, artists have been able to make more markets for themselves. Right. Not everyone with an equal amount of success. But even people who were forced into engineering now look at the internet and see it as a platform that they can leverage to, you know, make their arts dreams come true after all these years. The things that they were not allowed to do when they were in school, now that they are engineers, they're trying to leave and come back to it. Right. So from what I do understand, um, and that is assuming that you and I establish a common ground that there is a free market problem, right? That since India is in the movement from a primary sector to a secondary manufacturing sector, we are more inclined to create people who would be helpful in the manufacturing end of things. And therefore, you know, uh, at least as far as engineers go, they sort of are accommodated in, 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 on that front. I'm more curious if the societal discourse around it sort of also adds to the problem. And I mean, the question is pretty self-evident. The answer is in some sense, yes. But what I'm really looking for here is what should society's response be to arts? My, or to put it more specifically, why are arts great? How do they compete I think against? The arts, mm-hmm. So I was at, I would, I was at this uh, science festival a couple of months ago. 
I still don't know why they invited me, but I think they wanted a humanities perspective on arts because there seems to be more of a consensus right now that the sciences can learn from the arts and that the arts can help the sciences or can learn from the sciences. At any rate, there can be some amount of uh, co-mingling. So the consensus seems right now to be that uh, the engineers that are coming out of Indian schools and colleges, they lack communication skills. And uh, communication skills are loosely defined as something that belong in the humanities front. And since the internet is some, it, it's a place where you have to be a good communicator at the very least. You have to be able to come up with ideas, but also communicate them effectively. So humanities are an area where I think a lot of science streamers can uh, get something that is useful for them. Hmm. The rest of the question was what? So, I mean, I am an art student myself. I study liberal arts, right? My areas of okay. study are economics and psychology primarily, which is yeah. what my majors are. I am still at school here at Columbia University in New York City. Okay. But yeah, I saw that on your bio. Right. I also have, um, my interests are philosophy, history, sociology, anthropology, but I, even politics for that matter, but I approach them very sideways using the lens of economics and psychology. It will be fair to say okay. that I'm an art student and I have never for once questioned yeah. why I'm doing arts. Right. My, uh, my, and I mean, the communication aspect is all well and fine. My intent with that question is to ask, what is it that studying arts give that studying a specific pointed specialized science, be that construction engineering, civil engineering does not. So in this thread that I wrote a few years ago that I was talking about the one that went viral and because of which my bio contains angry art student, I had written about how the disciplines that you're pursuing economics, psychology, etc., are foundational to human civilization. And you can build as high a bridge as you want, sorry, as high a wall as you want and as long a bridge as you want. At the end of the day, human society runs on humans. And humanities provide you with a way to understand how humans work. Hmm. A big problem with the way our policies are being made these days, I don't know about where you are, but right now in India, a big part of the problem right now with the policies that are being made is that the policies are being made by people who are not taking the human quotient into the equation. Hmm. So everything becomes a number. Everything is about uh, uh, an app. Everything is about uh, a database. A statistic. On a, on a national level, if you build a database of citizens and you make a mistake of even 1%, you are leaving out millions of people. Hmm. And that is a problem that someone without an access to the humanities way of looking at things will not be able to appreciate Right. for the most part. Right. I think right. when someone studies humanities, even as a science student, what happens is that they gain an understanding and a, an appreciation for being in the other person's shoe, which is not something our science, I mean, sciences at their ideal are about understanding the human position in the universe. But the way we are teaching th sciences, we are creating mechanics. We are creating uh, mechanics and, uh, you know, people who can't even convey what they know. We are creating so, efficient bodies, not creative bodies. Yes, we're creating well-trained people to quote three idiots. We're creating well-trained people, not well-educated people. <laughs> right. And I think, I, think, I think that is what the sciences can take from the humanities. Right. Let me try and strengthen your claim and tell me if this makes sense in terms of vis-a-vis -vis the arts and, and, the, and the following discussion. I think the arts, arts, social sciences, right? Liberal arts that refer specifically to the complexities of human systems, be that economic complexities, right? Understanding the market and understanding the invisible hand and understanding social policy from there, economic policy from there, be that psychology, be that sociology, community psychology, be all of these subjects, what they sort of do is they illuminate the intricate complexities of human systems. And what that goes on to do is it, it broadens your horizon forever, teaches you that there is not one way to life only, there is many ways to life and makes you appreciative of the human experience in a way that yes. a pointed measure from a barometer measuring the depth of an ocean within the field of geography, within a field of oceanography, like 
the, the it is i think there is something to be said about the ambiguity of social sciences teaching us about the breadth of possibilities that only and yeah. only an education in arts provides and being a doctor and being a be, being a being a goldfish like attention span to a to a to an engineering profession would never get you that and that is why people read yeah. books those are artistic books those are those are you know so i am an engineer i am working my high paying job but i am also reading uh, jiddu krishnamurthy on the side why yeah right so so you are you are absolutely you are absolutely correct to that extent i think the most important thing you mentioned there was the word ambiguity that is what the humanities teach you to get comfortable with and that is exactly the thing that 2 plus 2 equals 4 does not train you for bang on bang on okay so it's literature it's 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 reading about a character's life and then crying or laughing understanding full well that this is something someone made up and that puts you in touch with your human ability to empathize right right so that allows me to sort of extend my question to you that a question that i had been thinking about because i was a uh, I was shabby enough to ignore a joke that you had sent me earlier. I was not attentive enough to respond <laughs> to it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you know what? Let's start with a let's start with something humorous enough, right? Given you are an art student, brilliant at communicating, understand the ambiguity. What do you think about this Dia Jalao thing that's about to happen tomorrow? I I I did have a conversation about this with someone a short while ago. Someone who was uh, someone who was disagreeing with me, but not uh, impolitely. Mm-hmm. and i told him that you have a prime minister who ha- who has the power to talk to a lot of people and he is also someone who a lot of people listen to mm-hmm. and now we are faced with a choice the 9 minutes of con- uh, screen time that he had would that have been better used by telling by giving the people of india useful information or w- or was that better used by telling them to do something that has at best symbolic value mm-hmm. so and with that choice in front of you if you say that lighting candles is more useful than statistics uh decisions about how much money has been assigned where uh or even you know we had this meeting and this was decided and this is what we are going to do from now hmm. then you know that's the choice we have to make right so let's complicate that a little bit more right so first i don't know if the constraint for the 9 minute screen time is necessary it could have been 15 minutes agreed the second thing is that there is not just a singular communication channel there is multiple communication channels and once we complicate that picture to this extent right where we add two more variables the real question remains one between the symbolic and the tangible what has better competitive advantage right what is better said is it the symbolic or and two can we accommodate both in this in the same screen we, time we we most definitely can accommodate both i would have had no problem if the prime minister had said here are the stats here are the details that you guys have been asking for 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 a month but then also in the end please light a candle that was okay right we sh- we can and we should balance it i mean right now i am the guy who told you 5 minutes ago that the arts are important i am telling you right now that the artistic aspect of it has kind of overtaken the uh, you know practical aspect of it and and you and know that 9 the, minutes i think i think i have another creeping suspicion and that is that people are people in this government are not talking to each other so the prime minister announces out of the blue that he is going to talk to the nation at uh, 9 am in the morning and then it is that prasar bharati announces that ramayan is going to be delayed by a little because of the prime minister's address hmm. so i don't know if communication from the prime minister to the people of india is at this level how much better can communication between the prime minister and his own people in his own office can be hmm. Hmm. that's a that's a good point that's a good point and i think you are very fair with your criticism too because i will not rule out the the symbolic ceremonial psychological aspect of this quote yeah. unquote war on corona virus um living in new york uh, my parents will call me up daily and they'll be like so how's it in new york we hear all these ugly uh, ugly things about it and i'm like it's like i'm looking out of my window right now it's like any other day it hasn't changed and the reason is that the enemy is invisible and are you still there hold on oh yeah okay. something happened w- what variety yeah. of something you're right so um when my parents call me and ask me you know what is up in new york and and i and i look outside and i'm like it's it's the same nothing's really changed people are still outside blah 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 xyz abc and the reason why that 
saying that induces a sense of panic and anxiety and this unknowing is because the enemy is invisible and ritualization helps us make the enemy at least one degree more tangible apart from the morale and the solidarity it helps you in a very definite psychological sense and nobody is taking that from the prime minister or anybody else at all but the real question is why can arvind kejriwal go live on twitter every day and tell you for 30 minutes or 40 minutes whatever is bloody up with this government and the one man that everybody is willing to listen to is not doing so yeah right i think there is some kind of logistical issue here also i think the prime minister or someone in the prime minister's office is having meetings with the state chiefs every day or as often as possible and it is at the end of the day something that the state governments had to take care of hmm. but the prime minister being totally out of it is what bothers me hmm. because the prime minister and this is not just about this one thing the hmm. prime the expectation from the prime minister is that he will come out and say something but when violence happened in delhi last he was not out talking much about it we right. were getting comments in the par- the, the 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 biggest discussion about it i uh, saw happen was uh, on twitter there was a tweet from the prime minister there was some other conversation but nobody i think got closure from the words that the prime minister spoke there was discussion in parliament that got stalled two times and then happened and uh, you know there is a problem with the prime minister's office not holding many press conferences or mm. en- why many there have been no press conferences mm. and at a time like this people need to have you know they ask a question and the question is answered by the person in charge that is happening on state levels kerala is doing a great job uh, maharashtra i just had a conversation with a friend who said that he's happy with the way things are being run there despite uh, covid 19 taking a kind of bad uh, growing to a bad size right now in maharashtra states are doing well i think the central government right now does not have much to do on that front but the, the prime minister can at least address us you know have regular conversations that make sense absolutely and you know the surprising part is i think after i have been politically conscious just like aware of what is happening in the political sphere from a very young age so i would i would go to go on to say that since i was 10 or something i've been listening to politics if not understanding it and as i grew i understood more of it too and i feel like this is probably the first time ever where people are happy in terms of the way government and bureaucracy is running things not entirely but happier than i've ever seen them right without this element of bhakti faith whatever they have towards the current regime or whatever i think it. overall overall uh, that is something that is debatable mm-hmm. but uh, the bhakti phase itself has become kind of a problem with respect to the communal violence that we are looking at the uh, the discriminatory laws that people were protesting some time ago mm. with respect to shaheen bagh and other things people have not had i will personally tell you that it since december 2019 i have not been the same person that i was before because for a duration of time for two months uh, in the beginning of 2020 every single day it was almost an anxiety attack something was happening somewhere uh, people were giving hateful speeches delhi elections were going on uh there was uh, there were people coming up inside delhi going into universities violence was happening there protesters were being fired upon it was horrible so i don't know how fair it is to say that people are happy with governance mm-hmm. i think people are in love with the prime minister for sure a lot of people are in love with the prime minister and the ones who are not are not even close there is a there is an increasing i wrote about this a few days ago there is an increasing trust deficit that is happening people don't have faith in doctors people don't have faith in police people are beginning to question the supreme court the government as it is has always had its credibility questioned so these are very difficult times i think um, to and that sort of relates to your point about the internet making things easier for comics before but i think part of the reason is that we are operating at near saturation with our models so the market model of things as far as media is concerned has devolved down to theatricals as competitive advantage if i am dramatizing my story if oh, i am absolutely right i agree and, and th- that is where the loss of credibility begins in a system now the signal that the media throws at me or social media throws at me i will not believe i will find an alternative source where will that be whatsapp 
but my child will never buy into WhatsApp. And so it's not just a unidirectional trust deficit, but it is also as if there are, we are no longer looking at the same thing when we are talking to each other. We are, it's, it's like there are two elephants in the room instead of one, and we are both addressing different elephants. The narratives are so calcified on either side of the equation, no matter what equation it is, that they're no longer the same in any sense at all. Do you find that to be a problem? If you're talking about social polarization, then yes, it is a problem. But see, I was talking about a trust deficit some time ago. And a trust deficit is not something that cannot be avoided. There has to be a clear message from top that the things that you are worried about, we have heard you and we are doing something about them. But what we have seen since the beginning of 2020 is that the things that people are worried about, people are being, people are being, uh, you know, people are being victimized for it. So from a minister, we hear that the protests are anti-India when the protests are being done by people of India. And that's not helpful. If we are to have uh, a discourse that is not as polarized as you just spoke about, then there has to be more trust between both sides. And that is not, it's in, if anything, the, the divide between the ideological divide is being deepened mm -hmm. with our, our main, you, you've seen our television channels, right? Our news channels. Mm -hmm. They are consciously polarizing the entire issue. Mm -hmm. The way uh, actual issues of the day, even before coronavirus, we had a, an employment issue, we had an economic issue. And the number of channels, the number of media outlets who were talking about it were all online media. Hmm. Our television media, with the notable exception of a very few, our online Hindi media, for the most part, was focusing on issues that had nothing to do with our actual problems. Right. And that's a dangerous place to be. That's a dangerous place to yeah. be because there is a dependence. You can see clearly that the media, the fourth pillar of democracy has on the first two pillars of democracy, the legislators and the executives in some sense. But yeah. um, it's, uh, I mean, the media's job is to ask the government the questions that the people have. Instead, these people are asking people to answer questions from the government. Right. But let's do, and there is an activity. There is a particular format of a conversation I get into when we get around topics that can be sticky, muddy, extremely controversial. And I've learned my lesson from the past because I've had conversations where I've let people say what they want. And so what I do usually is I animate myself in the opposite and we try to bridge the gap by us playing a game. You and I, right? Got it, got it. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'll steal man the opposite position and you tell me what you think. So you can say, you can reasonably say that the top, the center, the government, the, 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 the leaders of the party are making statements that are questionable, that they are mm -hmm. saying something like those protests were anti India and they were not anti a particular topic in question. They were anti India yeah. as a concept. I can say, yeah. I can say, I would say that it isn't that these protests that you're talking about being anti India are, um, anti-topic, they, they, they aren't, they don't relate to a topic. They are, they, they have motivations that are ulterior to them. And if you want evidence, I can produce a bunch of WhatsApp videos from Jamia Melia. I can produce a bunch of WhatsApp videos from Shaheen Bagh that show that the mm -hmm. intention of these people is far from just NRC. It goes to a different extent, a, a, a different degree that I'm not comfortable with. You see my point? So how would you respond to that? That you is bad actors on both sides is what I'm trying to say. Oh, I, I would not deny that possibility. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But from what I have seen, the law itself, when the law says, the law that is being proposed, the CAA, when the law is being criticized because it goes against Article 14 uh, of, uh, you know, against the equality that the Constitution of India grants people and that no law shall, shall be made on grounds of religion. When that point is made, we need to hear some kind of a response from the people who made the law that, you know, that is, uh, okay, we have heard your concerns mm. and this is what we are going to do about it. Mm. Uh, instead, what we hear is no matter how much you protest, this law will get passed. So it, it seems like in, in a game theory kind of a way where you and I are two participants and I cheat and you cheat. My job as the government, as the, as the status quo, as, as the people in power and responsibility is to make more responsibility is to res respond more responsibly out of this. So my, my, my general qualm with this entire issue is 
if say bad faith actors are doing bad faith stuff you should not indulge in the same game and deepen the polarization what the government sort of yeah. tries yeah does that make because, sense listen listen the caa was the law that triggered the protests of shaheen bagh mm. now the ruling party of india ran the delhi election on the plank that the shaheen bagh protests were anti india mm. now answer this if the protests were anti india and were being funded by people from abroad and the government has evidence of this why were the protests not uh, you know stopped mm. fundamentally why in the national capital for four months a protest that is allegedly being funded by people from outside india is allowed to run and then why is that protest allowed to become an election issue which causes multiple politicians to give uh, speeches that have been described as uh, incitement hmm. Hmm. and why is the you know why even today the people who gave those speeches are not being reported not even an fir is being filed against them so there is a clear there is there is a claim from the government but that claim does not even match their own actions because if they think that these protests are anti india hmm. they have not taken action against the people who have uh, you know funded and fueled these protests right and for I, I, all practical purposes when i look at these protests i see people who are indian who have a record of standing up for people who are being marginalized and these right. protests are being spearheaded by people who i know and respect right i i don't want to get too lost in um, ca for the particular reason because you know political issues involve too many facts to be put into picture to you know have a proper commentary on them um, but i will end that little note and then carry over to another question with this the yeah. reason the reason the way somebody might be able to defend that is saying that it is the people's fundamental right to protest no matter where the funding is coming yeah. from and we will let the free yeah. market of election decide who they believe and so the government yeah. is actually being the bigger person by being like okay you want to protest go ahead protest it does not bother us because your claim is faulty so forget that let's move on to something more pertinent and more pernicious one question I, if i can ask please please do you think when the government if i can ask please please when the government says that we will allow the protest are they allowing so because a protest is something that is uh, uh, constitutionally valid and if yes then why are there election speeches peppered with uh, you know villainization of the people who are protesting i mean they're not they were not that's a measure of counter protest I think, I think, sorry that's a measure of counter protest right you are allowed to protest and i am allowed to say what why the I government want. the government why is the government protesting against people protesting against the government the government is not in the business of protesting no of course not but they are in the, the business of making laws and they're in the business of setting the discourse too to some degree right to set, set to setting a narrative too so i mean see again we can get lost in this world i don't know if i will say that the government is in the business of setting a narrative i think the government has a narrative but the narrative has to be pursued honestly with right. as little deception as in possible an in an ideal world yes but the word deception yes. is hidden between the word politics so there is very little we can do to that effect but okay you know True. there is another there is another pernicious issue that you picked up on earlier and i really want to break that down because i'm really looking for answers on that and myself and that is this okay. romanticization of prime minister modi right this deep love that our state has fallen in with our with our quote and quote leader and i don't understand why that would be the case i have a few guesses that i will tell you as we go on but why do you think is that happening i think it's the kind of the same okay so in india we anyway have this tendency to deify our leaders because we have a feudal mindset with respect we don't we we are on paper a democracy but uh, we still very much live in the time of kings and queens so a local leader be it a local leader or a prime minister everyone thinks that they are maiba mother father everything hmm. so uh, even indira gandhi had this thing narendra modi having this thing is not really a surprise and hmm. uh, uh, marketing plays a role in it to a certain extent i think and uh, when it does not it's a very well handled media machine hmm. that spans from the hindi news channels to whatsapp groups hmm. to twitter trolls who set the narrative every day and a large part of the narrative in recent months has been that uh, you know i'm yours hmm. and you are mine it's it's literally a love story 
I have written about this, and to a certain extent, it even seems to be a toxic relationship. Right, right, right. Interesting. Um, you are right. I think there is a tendency to DFI that is present in India that is absolutely not the same in certain parts of the world. I don't deny that, and. The evidence of that is our Bollywood cricket politics trinity, right? If you belong yeah. to any of them, you are a hero automatically. My, my first point of guessing um, when exploring this phenomena is wondering how much that has to do with religion and God. So I have a theory and it's a very, it's an oversimplification. It's not sophisticated enough. Tell me what you think about it. And the theory is with the descent of God, with the descent of God or the dilution of God, which is an omnipotent, omnipresent phenomena in the Hindu in the Hindu religion, religious sphere leads to an ascent of man that our need to, to create an authority figure to deify something is so, so strong that when there is no God that we can deify, we will start deifying people. And that is the case that you will find to be similarly in America as well, where, you know, there is some amount of deification of the political leaders that there is absolutely no way my yeah. political leader or my Hollywood star could be wrong on my, right. And I wonder if, if you feel similarly, it's because that there is such a dilution in terms of being able to pinpoint as to what God or what Supreme authority rules over us that we let these people become our gods instead. I think uh, more than the idea of God, at least from the Hindu point of view, this has something to do with belief in absolute virtue, which means that if someone is good, they have to be absolutely good. And if someone is bad, they have to be completely like Mordor level evil. Mm. So we have a politician and we have their fans and people can see no good, no, not, not, no bad in them at all. Mm. If, if, they're, if you love them, they are the best thing in the world. And if you hate them, they're the worst thing in the world. Hmm. From the Indian point of view, where uh, belief in a personal God is not necessary, at least for Hindus, that's the perspective that makes most sense to me. Hmm. Hmm. How do you... So, another, another inquiry that I've sort of had in, this, in the same direction um, is that... And this is this is a little more sophisticated than my last guess as to why this emergent phenomena of nationalism has taken over India with such a grip that it does not seem to ease itself even over the next five, seven, eight, nine years. I think you know, and um, is because I think has, it's going to be our lifetimes. At least think, my lifetime, it's going to be until we get out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, like you know, Indira Gandhi made some things popular, and Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru made some things popular. Mm -hmm. And we still live in a world where those ideas have currency. Mm -hmm. But with respect to what has happened uh, on the nationalism front, I think it's going to be at least my lifetime before these ideas become something that are challenged. Well, you get, you get we enough have... to talk about them for the rest of Sorry? your life. I said, then you get enough content to talk about them for the rest of your life. Yeah. However long that life might be. <laughs> <laughs> No, so so I have a, I, I, I think uh, I was going off on a tangent on a theory, but before I go there, I want to ask you, you had something about this virtue addiction kind of a narrative in the positivity addiction space. You were talking about this, this need for us yeah. to define clearly what is good and bad is also sort of replicated in this constant addiction to positivity. When I talked to my father about, so I was speaking to him about the whole uh, Modi issue, right? And I was like, he should have spoken about something more substantive than just Diya Jalao. And he's like, listen, I just look at the positive in the equation. He did this. We'll, we'll wait for the rest yeah. of the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I want you to talk a little bit about this positivity addiction malaise that you think we are suffering from. So that I think has directly something to do with privilege because uh, what happens is that uh, the farther away from direct damage that you are, the more your uh, chances of, I can't see you. I'm here, ah. I'm here, I'm here. Sorry. So the farther away from direct damage that you are, I, I made an analogy today earlier. I wrote a small post about it, which is that there is the ship and there is a hole in the ship and the waters are stormy and the sky is stormy and it's raining. And some people are telling the captain that uh, there is a hole and the captain is saying, you should all sing songs and play games. Hmm. And then some people say that that's not going to solve the problem. And hmm. other people say, why do you have to be so negative all the time? Hmm. And that's because these people live on the upper decks where the flooding hasn't started yet. 
that's a brilliant analogy i must so, say that so privilege makes you privilege give, positivity is basically a way to avoid feeling guilty or responsible not always but often i mean right. positivity is actually necessary in a time like this i think uh, i told you about how bad a mental shape i was in in the first months of 2020 i was watching old jaspal bhatti episodes every night before going to sleep or i couldn't sleep Mm. and even that was not enough to take me out of it so positivity is absolutely necessary but when you know it's like anesthesia you have an illness and the doctor will uh, check your resistance to anesthesia before injecting you otherwise it will become too much and it will start affecting parts of your body that you need to stay alive so anesthesia can ease your pain but it can also stop your heart it can also kill you and that's what's happening with positivity right now people have such a desperate need to you know be positive right yeah feel good that they're not even paying attention to things that they should be paying attention to at the risk of destroying everything that we are hmm. Hmm. so i think that was very well put i think that has cleared some stuff in my head as well as far as positivity in you know the entire narrative around that is concerned and i think this will make for a very valuable segment in the podcast to uh, to people that i can eventually send this to and be like hey listen here is here is a reasonable rational idea about the whole phenomena i have another question and this one is going to bridge me to something far more interesting that i want to get to you with so this question okay. is about the theory i was speaking about earlier and my theory is part of the reason why there is such a romanticism with the idea of india and as 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 an as a nation state has to do with the fact and this and this fact is is often thrown around in the discourse politically as well has to do with the fact that we were not even ruled by our own selves we were not even slaves to our own selves we were ruled by somebody from the outside for a considerable amount of time nobody is taking that away from us that is a clear case of victimhood that we yeah. can't deny and then we get independent we get independent with pakistan at the same point in time and then we work our asses for 70 years hard we were really hard to finally be able to stick our neck up like one of the big players in the nation state market yeah. space right india has now the currency enough to begin competing with the big big ups the big players it's it's not winning there but it now at least has that and as soon as that that started happening a sense of pride for for reclaiming a national sense of identity started manifesting that was capitalized on by this particular mm. political party and so mm. my best possible my most sympathetic interpretation to this phenomena is that it it comes from this long lost sense of self that is being reignited that you you were being promised everything that you were denied for denied off for so long that you're like you know what this is the right guy for me do you think that could be the case for the motivation behind this kind of fanaticism that we have towards prime minister modi listen i think it is a very good thing to be a big player on the world field but i think being a big player in the world field and appearing to be a big player in the world field are two different things when you have a country where most people i'm not saying that this is something narendra modi caused just to be on the record of course i think congress has the congress had a number of years of misrule under its belt when modi came and the one of the reasons that narendra modi was put into power is because a lot of people were super fucking pissed at congress i was one of them i supported narendra modi's candidature to prime ministership likewise i uh, sorry i said likewise yeah so the reason i am right now not in the best frame of mind with respect to narendra modi is because i feel that he has gone back on his promises hmm. i thought that when narendra modi was going to come to power i thought it was going to be like atal bihari vajpayee's years you know the right wing extremists will make some noise and uh, overall it will be peaceful makbul fida hussain who was forced to leave india he was a painter once he said that i will only return to india when the bjp is in power because they'll be under pressure to not let anything happen to me because it will look bad for them hmm. i think we have gotten to a point where even the right wing does not care what they look like right now hmm. everyone is going for the extremes hmm. and i see it more happening more on the right than on the left hmm. i get called a leftist more than once every day these days and it makes me laugh because people don't know what my political background is i am someone who cries when he watches the ramayana i am someone who ran a mythology youtube channel for 2 years i am someone who has written comic books based on hindu mythology i love my religion and i am an atheist on top of that so 
the right wing right now the way it is working is not and i can't be the only one who thinks that we have all been let down mm. by the people who we put in power mm. Mm. sorry so, what was your question no i mean you you answered my question absolutely accurately i i was wondering okay. if that theory the sense of pride theory made any sense uh, in in understanding oh, yeah absolutely like you said it was capitalized upon mm. and it is still being capitalized the congress also tries to do this to a certain extent but i think if india at some point of time in the future is to become what they call quote and quote a superpower then india will have to open its eyes to see what it truly is right we cannot like we cannot uh, hide behind positive thinking we cannot embrace an image of ourselves that is not true we cannot trade off being realistic for being romantic you can be romantic to the extent you don't have to trade it off with realism ha huh? right now we are the kings of romance we are all right. shahrukh khan right now all of us all of us and and <laughs> modi ji is our kajol right so i yeah. i i feel you on that but here is a question that stems from here and the question is how the hell do we begin resolving this this comprehension drought the fact that i cannot even speak to my father for that matter him and i don't share our politics exactly or the fact that i cannot speak to my uncle for that or anybody so that's I, everyone's problems right now everyone's enemy is their own father right and and <laughs> you know that and exactly so politics is at that point modi ji is at that point where they are where fractions within the family are being formed because of politics how do we begin to resolve that you're talking about how to convince your family i mean or or even create a space for disagreement how do you instantiate that i before i started giving people advice about how to uh, solve the gaps with their own families i solved it in my own family and mm-hmm. fortunately that was not much work mm-hmm. like like myself my own family was also in support of narendra modi and i think a lot of them still are mm. but the conversations that i have with them don't necessarily you know the i think the most important thing is to not stop talking mm. and one of the things that we have to do is that you know if you if you if when you get into a discussion if it becomes a quarrel leave it mm. but don't let them think that their viewpoint is the only one mm. like yeah. the bjp's campaign in 2014 and uh, no not so much in 2019 but in 2014 their campaign was congress mukt bharat and a lot of a lot of and i was definitely one of the idiots who got seduced by it but i think in the future i would like even if the bjp loses the coming elections i would like the bjp to remain the opposition hmm. because we have problems that no political party is going to take care of there has to be an opposition to curtail the freedoms of the government you're right like if the congress right now the congress right now is making some of the right noises by trying to become a good uh, opposition party but laws like sedition law or uh, the censor board these are not things that any party is going to do away with hmm. these are things that are useful to anyone who is in power right um a few things that i like to say in terms of distilling a conversation like this the first thing is don't make political leaders your heroes yeah make the concept of india your hero whatever the concept yeah. you want right your political leaders are servants to that concept and they may not be loyal servants i will go one step further your political leaders are servants of you mm-hmm. you hired a guy to do a job if he is not doing the job you have the right to throw him out and bring someone else in right. that is what elections are the elections are a job interview precisely and then the second thing is do not romance your political leaders in fact i will go one step further and say never trust your political leaders your job is to keep them yeah. accountable not in not exactly. trustable ask them questions and strengthen the institutions which are designed to keep them accountable like your courts your media and all these other things the third thing i would say is that usually one narrative does not cover the extent of present phenomena so the the idea is that both you and your opposition whoever you are arguing against both of you are wrong on some account so identify where you are wrong that builds credibility if i say listen this part true, i'm unsure true. right then we can exchange true. a conversation the 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 four i have had conversations in recent times with people who i told i'm sorry to interrupt please, please, but please. i have had conversations with with people in recent times where i said uh fine you love the prime minister i get it you have the right to support a politician but not when it comes at the cost of the people who this prime minister was elected to serve 
Mm-hmm. Right. So I am not disputing people's rights to stand up for a politician or a political party or an ideology. Mm-hmm. I'm saying, you know, that can't be all that defines you. You are an Indian, yes, right. but you are also a lot of other things. Don't confuse. You Indian are a neighbor. People. You are a yeah. Right. Don't confuse India for Modi's India. Those are different things. There is exactly. my India and there is. This your is what India. Congress also did when their election campaign was in India. Is India. Mm-hmm. And now these guys are doing the same thing. And it was a bad idea then. It's a bad idea now. Just because another political party is doing it does not make it proper. Right. Right. And then there is the last thing that I say. Let me see if I can remember that. Is yes. Be aware when your motivation dissolves into wanting to be right instead of wanting to be right eventually. So it, let your conversation be a learning process, not an argumentation process. Right? We are so yeah. bent on appearing right the first time around we say something that we don't allow ourselves the ability to find out that we might be wrong, which is the cornerstone yeah. of evolution. I think I'm, I think to a certain extent, uh, I'm guilty of this. Mm-hmm. I lose track of the bigger picture and sometimes it, you know, it's, it's the online space and there's a troll and you can, you know, you can say something snarky and uh, get an upper hand, but I've been it, learning my way out of it. I've been trying more and more to accommodate voices. Although I have very strict laws on, uh, yeah. uh, I have very strict rules on my Instagram profile about the kind of behavior I tolerate because there are other people on my comment threads and I want my threads to be a uh, safe space for people mm-hmm. because most places online right now are not. No, so not. I, 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 I say, I say it's a zero tolerance space. You either, you present your point of view with as much respect as possible, or I will block. That's right. All. Right. <laughs> then, I mean, and, and that's absolutely fair. Once you have your negotiation chips, you're like, this is what I'm going to negotiate with. You can disagree with me as long as you are, you know, fair to the idea. Otherwise start a bye-bye, no yeah, straw manning yeah. here, nickel job. Right. But you know what yeah. also interests me about you? And what do you want me, is Vijendra a better name or should I use your moniker Vimo? Because I like Vimo. Up to you. I prefer Vimo. Okay, Vimo. So Vimo, yeah. it interests me very much that somebody who's so infatuated by the stories that form part of our mythopoetic religious culture has... Did you look that up? Your, your Rav, uh, Ravanayana? Uh, no, no. The, the word Vimo means infatuation in Sanskrit. Interesting. I just thought that was a combination of uh, Vijendra. And it is, it is, it's, it's, it's a multi-level thing. Uh, you're playing meta, my friend. You're, you're, you're doing it all. <laughs> but tell me, no, tell me. I saw a video that you posted about how religion starts, right? And it seems yeah. like for a man who's so infatuated by this mythopoetic, this, this, uh, this ancient story tradition that we have, that you feel like the, 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 your your sense of religion to me to me appears very reductive that it sort of appears as a means of rationalization is mm. sort of your claim i wonder if there is a deeper understanding you personally hold of religion and there was a, a social requirement well, to i'll tell you what i understand and you can decide if it is deep or shallow okay but uh, <laughs> i think religion is inevitable which by which I mean that a football club is as much religion as uh, Buddhism is, which means that human beings by merit of being the kind of animal that they are, which is an imaginative animal who uses language, we will always create tribes. And a lot of the things that go into the making of those tribes are going to be of the imaginary kind. So gods are inevitable. Deities are inevitable. Heroes are inevitable spirits and magical properties of natural objects are inevitable. The thing that I do personally, because, okay, so when I was a kid, you know how kids stuff uh, toy pistols into their belts and play cowboys, etc. When I was a kid, I was the kid who did that. But when I was back to school or when I was eating, I kept the guns aside. Mm. So my entire thing, my whole life has been that there is a line between reality and fiction. I create fiction for a living. It's my bread and butter. Hmm. I go really deep into it. uh, Like how myth relates to storytelling, how literature creates the foundation of civilization, all that. I think that is where religion came from. And there is no universe where that was impossible. Hmm. We are always going to have religions. Hmm. What we can do is keep ourselves aware of what they are. 
because the moment we forget that religions were stories that we ourselves created we run into trouble mm. because we start killing actual human beings in defense of ideas that we ourselves created and i think human beings are more important right it's it's not just that human beings are more important but what you're defending at the cost of a human life is absolutely intangible and probably will reattain equilibrium if you don't kill either right it's this constant feeling that my faith is being hedged in the background so i will take yeah. your life yeah so if i don't kill this person in front of me my thousands of years of culture and religion will cease to exist tomorrow right that is what one of your religion is going to survive your religion survived before you it's going to survive after you it's way more powerful than you are ever going to be hmm. you the things you do in your life are you are responsible for hmm. and your religion has you know zero uh, your zero religion pain. doesn't give a fuck right yeah your religion doesn't give a fuck right it's 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 you know i was i was speaking to somebody about it um and in the course of it i started wondering i was like it is so funny that we are willing to defend with death something that we did not earn but we inherited right this yeah. idea that i mean i did not choose to be a hindu i i was never given an option i was just raised with those stories and by the time i was in a decision making age those stories were ingrained in me and now yeah. i will i will vouch for the fact that those stories have some great things to say some wonderful fantastic things to say but i will not yeah. sweat too much on the on account of defending that tradition yeah i think i am a little bit more traditional than that also because i will totally defend my traditions mm -hmm. but i will also fight against the interpretations that those traditions are being put to right now mm -hmm. like how do you know your interpretation names, is correct because it does not involve killing people and so uh, can you uh, can you say that a system that was meant to govern everything from politics to legality to ethics to morality to to social systems to hierarchies to to everything would not have an element of self preservation in it like the, the the reason why these religions continue to live was so that was because they eliminated all the other com competition so the system of killing is i'm totally in favor of self preservation as long as you're killing the people who are actually against you and not the people who are surrounding you i think self preservation is obviously an evolutionary goal that every living being has hmm. but if you are being chased by a bear but you end up shooting arrows at another animal hmm. then you are going to die because hmm. the bear is intact and you are attacking someone who is not even against you hmm. so a lot of things that happen in the name of religion right now we are invoking our gods to commit murder and stuff hmm. it's painful for a hindu to watch right. it's painful because these are not things that i as a hindu associate my religion with so how do we identify this phantom killing phenomena where i am not really killing the actual enemy if there is one at all when at all i'm doing is killing a phantom enemy that i'm creating imagining for myself how do we identify yeah. where not to kill and where is it okay to self preserve i think the first step has to be and uh, you have to understand what imagination is and how much in its power you are people don't realize that people so a religious story is an is a very old story but a story of a comic book superhero is a rather new story and we don't know that they're both stories the old story is so old that we have forgotten that it is a story when we realize that it is a story and that it is a story very much like the stories that we are telling right now we understand that it is not something absolute so an understanding of literature can be brought into an appreciation of religious texts and thereby we can maybe become more you know more capable of picking and choosing which aspects we keep because mm. a book that was written 1000 years ago is not going to be completely relevant to the conditions that we live under right now mm. if we appreciate that if we accept that then we are halfway there and the rest is you know uh, groundwork right paperwork. but 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 it, it sort of i'm trying to help you if somebody is ever listening to this and they are of the opposite predisposition politically than you are i'm trying mm. i'm trying to make help you make a case or at least solidify your stance on this issue so i'm going to push you a little bit further and tell me how this works out my concern is that in the the kind of chaos that we live in where signaling between systems between people media parliaments activists all of that is so unclear and there is so much cause to worry about ulterior motives 
it becomes very hmm. difficult for me to sort out who the real enemy of my stories is and to what extent a damage is sustainable is appreciable to preserve my stories right so g- given this scenario where if somebody knocks on my door tomorrow and i am living somewhere near delhi and they're like listen they th- these guys are trying to desecrate a, a, an an idol of ram in the nearby temple right how do i know if that requires that warrants me taking my sword or my gun out how much of that can be solved with how, how do i decide in this chaos i think it's not going to it's a, it's not a decision that's going to happen when someone is at the phone and telling you that it's going to happen over a longer period of time with as i said the understanding that ram doesn't need your help and that desecration of a statue and murder of a human being are things that should not be even in the same sentence being compared to each other because one is a work of imagination one is a work of history one is a cultural artifact so robust that you and seven other generations of your family will not be able to destroy it so how is how is uh, an attack on a statue going to affect the lives of you and your family hmm. and when you get to that point you can then perhaps counterbalance that decision you made about going out and saving your culture with how useful is it to me to alienate my own neighbors to attack actual living people who i have spent my entire life with and uh, hopefully come to the conclusion that imagination is very important hmm. but i serve my religion more by being nice to people because in the beginning the religion the reason religion came into being was to strengthen society hmm. and our instinct for tribalism is now breaking apart the tribes that we are in hmm. if we broaden our idea of what our tribe is so there is a hindu tribe there is a muslim tribe and they both exist inside the indian tribe hmm. but our tribal instincts which are go to war with anyone who questions my tribal beliefs if we allow those instincts to exist inside the india tribe then the india tribe breaks apart then maybe the hindu war please finish your last sentence again for me maybe the hindu tribe becomes stronger maybe the muslim tribe becomes stronger but that strength is going to come at the cost of a lot of paranoia and pain hmm. 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 right it the complication with something like that so the first interesting thing to note with that phenomena when this starts happening is that the positivity addiction sort of automatically yeah. subsides and we are no longer looking at the positive side of the whole thing so the positive side is exactly that that listen even even when you were under direct oppression for 500 plus years be that the mogul rulers or the british rulers your cultural iconography your cultural artifacts your gods quote and quote survive that because that story is so robust it's not going to die right yeah. and then the then the, the second thing that i would say on top of that is don't worry you are still overwhelmingly in presence of the story you are a majority right to the fact that even if there is one statue desecrated law and order will take care of it don't worry about that at all you are still your your icon remains robust to which somebody says yes we are the majority for now look what happened in kashmir in the 1990 right how do you begin responding to that as a rational atheist i would say what happened in kashmir was a result of people being unkind to each other and you are not going to solve the problems that arose out of that by being unkind to people right now because you do that then 30 years from now your children are going to be in the same space that you are right now so your if response you response to unkindness is kindness you say if somebody is being unkind be kind to them no not in the way that not in the way that surrender works right but if something happened 40 years ago and the people to whom it happened to even many of them have come to terms with it it's called it's hindi it might be called you know gade murde ukhadna ya fir purane zakhmon ko kuridna so if you do that you are basically making sure that the pain is never going to go over hmm hmm, hmm. like there was uh, under the after the death of indira gandhi there was the anti sikh violence in delhi but how much of anti hindu hatred do you see on in the sikh community right now not many we, not much 
yeah so the khalistani movement is an outlier at the moment but you know they still exist but for the most part no and do you think in the long run the uh, hindu society is going to become stronger if we hold on to hatred because of what happened in kashmir or do you think that in 30 40 years our children need to be able to be the way six are right now what do you think is the better future which is what will answer the rest of the question that is that is brilliantly put you are a very impressive man i'm glad i took this conversation up um, <laughs> i i have a few more questions um and then we can we can have you ask me questions too uh, but my my question is how does the fact that you wrote a ramayan from the point of view of ravan effect <laughs> your polit- do people do people vilify you for that they're like are isne to waise bhi ravan ki side le rakhi hai and this that ha yeah so occasionally <laughs> i do get a few comments like that but then i tell them to read it and they say okay send me a link and i say okay i'll send you an amazon link that costs 1000 rupees buy it and read it and they never read it so their illusions about me remain where they are <laughs> but ravanayan was not a story where ravan was the hero ravan mm-hmm. was still the villain mm-hmm. ram was still the hero we just went into a little detail about his motivations and we mm-hmm. made up a few things mm-hmm. for example uh, 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 the story has you know how ravan wanted to be immortal yes brahma and asked for immortality right and brahma did what he usually did in those days he said it's not possible mm-hmm. and ravan said that in in the actual ramayan ravan wants to conquer the universe in right. our story ravan said i want to take care of the universe hmm. and i think i am the only one who can because i understand darkness and i understand light hmm. he was the child of a sage and a rakshasi he was smack in the middle hmm. and brahma said that's a very noble intention but you are only one person and you are not going to be able to do it the universe is far too big for one person to take care of hmm. but what you can do is that you can make sure that a story called the ramayan gets told hmm. and that story will bring hope to many people right and the way to do that is for is for you to live your life as a villain hmm so that's what ravan does in our story he pretends insane. to be a bad guy so that this story may be told one day insane insane see i've been i've been reading a lot of uh, post modern work on the ramayan and the mahabharat written by many many authors from 8th century bhavabhuti to dharmveer bharati in the 1950s right it, they, they all have taken up one part of this grand or the two grand epics and they have reassigned agency so instead of looking at it from ram's lens let's look at it from sita's lens and then let's put a few modifications in and see what final product yeah. is created and i think i mean I, so i have a romantic past with these stories too my father would tell me these stories as a child every night before i'd go to sleep and i fell in love with them before i knew what love was like these were yeah hunting so they were philosophical i tell you even today when i read the ramayana or watch the ramayana the scene where ram is leaving ayodhya to go live in the forest and everyone is telling him not to go i cry every single time <laughs> okay. but you know what uh, it's it's also like um, when i was i was reading mahabharat uh, the other day and i was like this is so much more badass than avengers like let's yeah, be totally real these guys you know so in 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 all that sense i've been i've been a fan forever but reading these slight modified renditions they put me in um, such a such a wonderfully complex space so dharmveer bharati what he did with andhayug was he basically criticized the freedom of struggle movement the the, the struggle for freedom the freedom of india movement the, whole, <laughs> I, I, the freedom struggle movement the freedom struggle movement <laughs> <laughs> right so he criticizes that entire thing using an analogy from the mahabharat itself and the mahabharat was roped in for the struggle yeah. to become an icon yeah. for hinduism so yeah. he uses the same tool we used to get free it's a lot like what bal gangadhar did with ganpati interest what did he do he brought in he turned ganesh into a deity of the people that's why he's called ganpati mm. that's why that's where uh, a lot of so you know consolidation of hindu sentiment against the british happened interesting interesting super have you read uh, bhavabhuti's rendition of uttra Ut- Ut- uttra ramcharita so he no, takes uttra he, he takes uttrakhand which is the last part of ramayan if i'm yeah. saying it correctly and you, uttarkhand, he uh, uh, uttrakhand and he adds like uh, a few twists to the end he introduces uh, valmiki uh, valmiki or vyas which which one did which, which one wrote ramayan 
Valmiki. Valmiki. So he introduces Valmiki in the story and he introduces himself in the story and he never makes a distinction as to who Valmiki is and who he is. We don't know who Valmiki was anyway. It's, it's a question mark as to who the yeah, original author yeah, of these texts yeah. was. So he sort of makes the claim that I could be it. And then he modifies the story by telling the future backwards. In, it's, it's, it's a very weird rendition, but it, 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 what, that goes on to, what that goes on to tell is that these stories have so many fractals emerging out of them that if discovered mm-hmm. properly, make for great reads. And I'm curious to get a hand on your read as well to understand how, where you are coming from with, uh, with Ravanayan. What, what other works have you done in this area? I did a YouTube channel called Epified, which, in which I did uh, have a serialized Mahabharata. But know, it was I not very, remember. you know. I just remember yeah, I've so seen some I, of your stuff. Like on YouTube? Yeah, and this is back, like, this is back a few years ago. I think yeah, I saw four years back, four years back. Mm-hmm. 2016 to right 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 there was something that caught my uh, curiosity so solidly i was like I, I think it was i'll have to look that up again and i'll hit you up about it but yes i i, I do remember seeing some stuff on epified yes 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 i still get mail from people saying sir mahabharat kab chalu hogi and i tell them bhai maine wo naukri chhod di hai wo kisi aur se agar likhwana chahte hai to likhwa sakte hain kahan kaun likhwana chahte hain epified no uh, epified was a channel owned by a company called culture machine hmm and they still own the channel and Mahabharat is incomplete. It's lying on the channel and there is no way to take it forward because the team that Epify, the team, Epify team was me and a, a few of my colleagues hmm. and that team no longer exists. Everyone has left Culture Machine and the channel does not really get updated. So the Mahabharat, uh, the extent to which we completed it, that's where it remains. Hmm. Hmm. What are your plans moving forward? How do you plan on taking this social activist side of you, the sense-making um, injection that you are to I society? I don't think of myself as a social activist, man. I no, don't, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I'll tell you something. Huh. I'll tell you something. Yes. I was like, someone asked me why you're doing science communication videos. Hmm. I said, because nobody else is. People, somebody has to. In an right. atmosphere like this, where well-educated, science-educated people are sending us Devi Devtao ki photos with hmm. wild conjecture about the reality. Hmm. Uh, in an atmosphere like this, I miss the 90s where we had science communicators on television. Professor right. Yashpal, Dr. Jayant Narlikar. We had shows like Turning Point. We are sorely lacking science communication on national television. All we have is foreign-made content in the form of National Geographic hmm. and Discovery. Hmm. Maybe they do have some Indian uh, content, but it's mostly travel. Hmm. Sci- actual science... Not just, you know, the details of how to build something, but a scientific outlook on life itself. Hmm. We are all scientific without knowing it. We Hmm. don't trust people without evidence. But when it comes to a certain politician or a certain religious belief, we are are willing to give up all our rationality. Right. So that is what I'm trying to uh, fight with these small videos I'm making. And the writing, I have been doing it in my personal capacity for a long time. It just suddenly became relevant because of the events of 2020. And a lot of more, lot of more, lot more people are reading it right now. But I don't think of myself as an activist. I'm just someone who wants to be done with this, so I can return to writing fantasy. Forgive, forgive my <laughs> implication. I, uh, my, my, my the, in, no, no, that's okay. In it's the a, particular it's a fashion, no, no, no. In the particular fashion that I meant it, I never meant it for, for you to uh, be compared to people who are shouting for the forest. Like it, it wasn't my implication to say that you are a social activist. No, no, I, I don't take, I don't think, I don't take it otherwise. I don't think there's anything wrong with being those people. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying I am not those people. Right. I, what I was trying to get at though was, was that you, there is a social activity on your part, which I call sense making activity, which basically combines the many variety of facts and put them in a story that is rational, believable, verifiable, robust, and all of those things. And in that limited sense, you have a social activity that I use the ism to, uh, to my own fault. So I wonder how, how do you mm-hmm. plan on taking this forward? What is, what is the end of your war? I told you this is going to last for my lifetime. The situation is going to last for my lifetime. If for whatever length of time that I might live, right. I'm going to have to, my, my only, my only, my only thing has always been that I have to be honest to myself. If I think that something is wrong, I have to speak about it. And if I think that something is right, I have to stand by it. That is all. Hmm. If politically my writing ends up making me a living, I'll continue doing it. But my first love has always been fantasy. I, I also do a podcast, by the way. Did that come up with uh, come up in your research? Maybe. Uh, what podcast is that? It's called Mytho Fiction. 
oh yes it did come up i i never got around to listening to it i will do listen ah, to so it so that's a it's an audio drama that ah. i got i got really interested in audio drama last year and i wrote a story called yugantar which i was converting into an audio drama i was five episodes in when all this national level stuff happened and my mind completely broke away from it hmm. the first season of it was five episodes that's where it remains and i do intend to return to it because the story is half done and uh, that's the kind of stuff i want to do i want to tell stories i want to write novels i want to do podcasts but somebody has to do this also and i don't see enough people doing it so i'm doing it interesting i will make sure that i put the link to almost all of your creations in the show notes below so that you know people have a direct access to your stuff because thank you, i truly no 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 don't thank me i truly think you were doing a job that more of us should be doing i am trying to do something in my own way but um it's been an absolute pleasure interacting with you it's you have you have not you you only you only um, how do i say you only added a premium to your value in, in my eyes after this <laughs> uh that, do you have any questions for me oh yes i wanted to ask you uh, about your podcast itself how hmm. old how have you how long have you been doing this i have been doing this a little over a year but only a little over half a year seriously okay my how did you manage to get guests like you know celebrity guests did you did they just respond well i have a zero shame factor genetically so i just uh, <laughs> i found anupam kher's number and i called him up straight and i was like hey uh, i am a student here in new york city i know you're in new york city can i meet you and that's okay. it uh likewise i did with um, i think no somebody put me in touch with abhinandan and i was like listen this is what i do do you want to hang out do you want to talk and um, uh-huh. i make i make a promising first impression because um i mean i'm not i'm, I'm not under delivering I, i i i hope i'm not under delivering so it works out well in my favor and uh, i have found most of my communication to continue well beyond the podcast as well primarily because i promise an interesting conversation and i deliver on it so it's been a lot of oh, you totally totally like you were not lying when you said about the first impression thing because i have I've seen the snippets of some of your uh, podcast and i love them i think the art of asking smart questions is something that is in such short supply that we can use many 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 more people like you because we are busy being the person with the answer not the person with the questions and i think it is yeah, so much me. right <laughs> you know, and there is a part of me that i reserve for answering as well you'll find that on my hindi youtube channel i i i exclusively call it pravachan i am pravachaning right i'm giving you <laughs> the divine nature and that is an irony that i'm playing to it's a comical thing that i'm playing to but i fancy myself better as a question man than an answer man what's the point mm. of being an answer man you're wrong anyway you never find out yeah. cuz time passes it's just physically impossible to know if you're right so why not ask yeah. better questions true so your podcast has been on for a year how many episodes so far 65 Oh wow like you do one episode every week recently since i start so what i was doing was when i started doing this a quick brief i started doing it with people around me friends and what not and i thought that would have a market and that did not then i started okay. elevating it a little i thought that would have a market and it did not and then i started elevating it to a grander scale and i figured by then that even even though i was having people worth listening to it would not elevate by itself until people know me podcast is a personality based industry right and yeah. so even if i want people to listen to me to gather whatever sense they can i have to sort of appear to be somebody who's competent enough and that's when i switched gears to start to do my hindi youtube thing as well where people can understand who prakar is and then if they want to hear more of prakar's interactions they can come to the podcast right okay and in the final leg of these increasing transformations the final leg was listen let's do podcast once a week and then let's throw out enough hindi content for, to build credibility so recently it's been more once a week before i had even done thrice a week stuff okay so do you get uh, online harassment over anything at all like do you get Uh, is there a particular thing that people attack you over not yet you know so they, i will have individual videos where i'll get attacked uh, i did one with ashish dhar um, i don't mm. know if you are if you've heard of that gentleman he runs something called upward and i'm definitely i've heard of upward yes right. it's a it's a it's a slightly conservative uh, not slightly uh, not slightly not slightly but okay. a reasonably conservative they're very reasonable yeah. people they're very prone to understanding logic and science they're not faith based and romantic in their core yeah, so yeah. i spoke to so mr so that goes for a lot of right wingers in india 
Right. So, and I, and I spoke to Mr. Dhar uh, and it was a fascinating conversation and that got me a lot of hits and a lot of subs. But also what happened was because I was animating myself to be the opposite of Mr. Dhar and explicitly so, we were still banning, mm-hmm. we were playing that game. Yeah, as you clarified in my conversation also. Right. And people shat on me a bunch. They were like, he's so impregnated by Western ideas. He cannot see Indian reality <laughs> like that. And I mean, you know, on YouTube, I just ignore that kind of stuff. Um, I do get once in a while, I'll put something political out, uh, my interpretation of politics, not my opinion of politics. Uh, and then people will come up, come, come at me. But I, like I said, I have zero shame quotient. I, mm. I'm very, I'm very thorough with the risks I want to take. So I will talk about sex and all of that stuff very, very openly knowing that my family is going to access that and people who, you know, have yeah. conservative views are going to access that. No problem. I, I, it's, a, it's a calculated risk. Politics uh, is an absolutely uh, madman show. It's, it's, you can get hit anywhere, anytime. So I'm a little reticent when it comes to politics in any case. I usually employ the steel man strategy to at least ensure that there is going to be no bad faith actors commenting on me after. They know uh-huh. that we are playing a game. Okay. Good. So nice. No harassment yet. And I'm not as big as you are. So I'm assuming as I scale up. Uh, Dude, I'm not big until, 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 uh, the middle of, until the end of 2019, I had, uh, so I crossed 10,000 followers on Twitter today and I have been on Twitter for 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> it feels so like a one was started and now I'm back to Ayodhya. <laughs> <laughs> you had to use that analogy. You're like, listen. <laughs> Bro, yeah, uh, nothing so, better to end it with. But you have some very influential people who follow you now, uh, as far as I can see your Twitter profile. Oh, you wouldn't know. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I know the people who interact with me in their comments and uh, who send me messages. Mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, I think some people have started following me in the last few months because apparently the, the message that I get most is I could not have said this better myself. See, and that's, listen, and that's, that's the job of philosophy in, in that limited sense. Yeah. You are a philosopher. I think I think of myself as a communicator now. Like I'm think I'm thinking the same thing that everyone is thinking. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying it in a way that they find that they have not been able to. Let me pay you a little more respect. I would go on to say, I, I would go on to say the job of philosophy is not to give you answers, but to frame the problem precisely. And I think if you were, if you were getting comments, like I could not have said it better, which is similar to what I get to on, on, on my posts, it's exactly the same. What you're doing is you're taking all these random ass facts that exist in the corpus of reality and then creating a consistent narrative thread that appeals to people without it trying to appeal to people. And in that limited sense, I would say you are more than just a communicator. If that is what you fancy, you can keep that. But I am willing to offer you the position of philosopher at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes think that I should have taken a liberal arts course in the West, Mm -hmm. but my family has never been someone who would be able to afford that. Mm -hmm. So I just filled my bookshelf with books and read as much as I can. Philosopher is still something I would hesitate to call myself. So I think Mm -hmm. I'll stick to communicator. Communicator is fine then. It has been an absolute (laughs) pleasure talking to you, Vijendra. Same here, man. Same here. Let's stay in touch. Yes. Let's stay in touch. Okay.